Okay. It does look like we are streaming live now on Facebook. So I will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Carrie Hawk Lassard, and I am the Executive Director of Native American Lifelines. I am sitting in a room with gray walls. I have long auburn and gray hair. I'm wearing glasses and a navy blue shirt, and I'm wearing beaded earrings that are green and blue as well. Um, I want to welcome you as uh, we host Jen Deerenwater, our relative and friend. Um, Jen will be helping us understand how we can create more inclusive and accessible space in Indigenous communities. Um, as the Executive Director of Native American Lifelines, I want to own that we have not always done the job that we need to do there. And so I'm hoping this is the first of many events where we will continue to uh, provide offerings that are accessible to all of our relatives, that are inclusive of all of our relatives. And I certainly invite anyone who feels that we are lagging in any area to reach out to me directly. And um, I would be happy to, again, just, just learn and, and to do better so that we're serving our community in a good way. Native American Lifelines is a Title V urban Indian health program that is funded primarily by the Indian Health Service. And we serve Native communities in Baltimore and Boston and, and the areas around. Uh, eligibility for Native American Lifelines uh, is simply this. We serve tribal citizens from federally recognized tribes. We serve enrolled members of state recognized tribes and anyone who can document their descendancy from either of those tribes. What we do at Native American Lifelines is offer outreach and referral services, meaning that we have um, case managers who can assist in connecting people with care. We have health promotion disease prevention activities like the one we're doing this evening. And we have direct dental care as well as behavioral health services inclusive of substance abuse and mental health care. It is our mission at Native American Lifelines to promote health and social resiliency within our urban American Indian communities. And we apply principles of trauma-informed care to ensure that we are providing culturally centered behavioral health, dental, and outreach services. Um, so the main event is that I am very, very proud to introduce Jen Deer and Water to those who do not know Jen. I had the great fortune to participate in an event, three R's that crushing colonialism did. And I knew that we had to have Jen speak to our community. So a bit about Jen. Jen is a bisexual, two-spirit, multiply disabled citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and an award-winning journalist and organizer who covers the myriad of issues her communities face with an intersectional lens. Jen is the founding executive director of Crushing Colonialism, a Disability Futures Fellow, and a former New Econo Economies, excuse me, reporting project fellow. Jen received a BA from the University of Southern California in Gender Studies and Political Silent science with an emphasis on American federal government, a graduate certificate in women in politics and public policy from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and an MS in communications management from Simmons College. Jen is a contributor to Truth Out, and her work has been featured in a wide range of publications, including Bitch, Rewire News, and New Now Next. Jen's writing is included in the anthologies Disability Visibility, First Person Stories from the 21st Century, Two Spirits Belong Here, and the forthcoming Building Narrative Power for 21st Century Social Movements. She's the author, or co-editor rather, of the anthology Sacred and Subversive, Queer Perspectives on the Future of Religious and Spiritual Communities, and is currently hard at work in her own book to be announced soon. Jen has been interviewed for numerous outlets on her work, and the advocate named Jen a 2019 champion of pride. While a nomad at heart, 
and raised in rural areas of her nation's reservation in Oklahoma and in rural Texas, Jen currently lives on occupied Piscataway land known as Washington, D.C. Um, and as I mentioned, we're always trying to do better and learn. Uh, what I'm understanding is that um, we are not able to see our ASL interpreter. We are trying to resolve that. It may be the case um, that we stop screen sharing so that we can uh, let the, the interpreter do their work. And um, Jen, if you have any advice around that, I'm happy to take it. Um, otherwise, we also have um, closed captioning enabled. So if you click the closed captioning um, button, uh, you can, can read uh, what we're all saying, probably imperfectly, but reading somewhat. And yes, thank you, Anna. Great advice. So I am going to stop talking. I'm going to uh, mute myself and stop my video and turn the time over to Jen. All right. Can we see the interpreter now? We can. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> So OCO, hello. It's really great to be here with you all. Um, I know we just had some issues with seeing the interpreter. So in case you didn't catch this, Carrie also told you all that you can turn on closed captions by clicking the closed caption icon on your Zoom screen. Um, so I am really happy to be here, very excited to, uh, to do this talk tonight and work with Lifelines and, and Carrie and the whole crew and just uh, want to say thank you to them all. And before I get started, I want to give an image description of myself like Carrie did when she began. Um, so I am a white coated native. That means that I'm light complected. I have brown hair. It's pulled back. I'm wearing black glasses and long red fringe leather earrings, and I have on a black V-neck t-shirt. And I'm sitting in a black office or a brown office chair. Um, so as Carrie read my bio, she told you all quite a bit about me, but I want to just talk a little bit about some of my own health issues and what you know has kind of brought me here tonight, not just professionally, but personally. Um, so I have had a host of health problems since I was quite young. Uh, by my early 30s, though, I was disabled and had to finally admit that to myself. Um, I have osteoarthritis and autoimmune arthritis. I have migraines. I have fibromyalgia. Um, I have really, really severe chronic pain, and it's created a lot of mobility issues for me. I have a lot of immune system issues as well, partially as a result. And then I also struggle with PTSD and complex PTSD and major depression. So I have a host of health problems going on. Um, and I feel like we need to talk more about disability in native community. And so with that, um, Sheba, would you go to the next slide, please, for me? So I think it's really important that before we get into how to address problems in our community that we know who we're talking about. Um, we only have an hour together tonight, so I, I can't teach you everything, but I'm going to try to give you a good sort of um, beginning first steps of knowledge. So I'm going to talk about ableism tonight. Um, it's a word that some of you may not be familiar with, so I want to define it for you. So ableism is the practices and dominant attitudes in society and institutions that devalue and oppress disabled people and those perceived as disabled. It's a set of practices and beliefs that deem people who have developmental, emotional, physical, or psychiatric disabilities as inferior. And so ableism, just like racism or sexism, it's not just the discrimination and experiences we have on a daily basis in our personal lives. It's also about institutional oppression. 
So that means that we experience ableism through the government, and that includes tribal government, <laughs> which I will speak on later. Um, religious institutions and spiritual settings can be ableist. Um, the educational system, employment systems, healthcare systems. And then we have the daily situations that we have with strangers, our family, friends, partners, loved ones, community. Um, so the next slide, please, Sheba, um, is about, you know, who Indigenous and disabled people are on a global level and in the so-called U.S. So the United Nations estimates that 15% of the world's population has a disability. And in the so-called U.S., approximately 19% of the population has a disability. So there are 360 million indigenous people in the world, representing 5% of the global population. Um, <laughs> I apologize, I got a little distracted. So representing 5% of the global population, comprising 5,000 distinct groups in over 90 countries. So there's scarce statistical data on deaf, disabled, and ill indigenous populations globally. Um, but some data suggests that the rates of disability are as high as 50% of some indigenous populations. So something I want you all to think about tonight when I'm talking about disability is that many of our tribal nations didn't have words like disabled. Disability and health weren't viewed in the colonial fashion that they are now. So some of our relatives may be disabled, but don't call themselves that. Um, also because of ableism and the violence that we experience on a daily basis, there are a lot of us, myself included, who hide their disabilities. Um, I did that for as long as I could as a survival strategy. So you can have people around you who are disabled or ill that you have no idea about um, because also 50%, about 50% of disabilities are invisible disabilities, meaning that we don't see them. Um, now, with all of that said, uh, those considered American Indian and Alaska Native, and I say considered because these are not our words, these are the colonial terms for us, um, but when I cite data, I want to be as accurate as possible. Um, so those of us that are considered American Indian and Alaska Native have the highest per capita rates of disabilities in the so-called U.S., 24% uh, of our population is disabled. So in 2019, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services found that American Indian and Alaska Natives made up only 1.7% of the total population. So I gave you all of this data because data tells stories, and it says a lot about who is disabled, um, and, and in particular, how many Indigenous people are disabled. Um, I want to add that I haven't found any concrete data on the rates of disabilities for Native Hawaiians, um, and that's partially because of how they are often also put in with Asian and Pacific Islanders. Um, but what I have been able to find out of studies is that Native Hawaiians have a significantly higher likelihood of rates of health issues like diabetes and hypertension. And so while terms vary across disabilities and communities, when I use the term disabled, I'm including a wide range of people. I'm including people who are deaf or hard of hearing, blind, um, have physical mobility issues, chronic pain, cognitive or learning or emotional, <clears throat> excuse me, emotional illnesses or disabilities, chronic illnesses. This includes things like diabetes or autoimmune arthritis, um, as well as trauma and mental health related illnesses. And I also want to remind you all that oppression can pile upon oppression. So when we talk about indigeneity and disability today, I want you to think also about how things like sexism or anti-blackness or bi or trans or homophobia also impacts our relatives um, in the ways that, that those forms of oppression are also adding on and compounding the realities of ableism. Uh, you know, depending on who you are, it can be really difficult to have a community space that you're truly welcome in. And so I want us all to remember that tonight. 
Um, so I want to go on to talking about why we have such high rates of disabilities. Um, Sheba, could you switch to the next slide for me, please? <clears throat> so we, we don't have high rates of disabilities or illnesses because of our genetics necessarily. It's because of the realities that we are living under. Um, and, and those are all informed and because of colonialism and genocide. So one of the first things that we're all dealing with, or so many of us are dealing with, is poverty. If you are poor, you're not going to have the things that you need to survive. And we know that Native people disproportionately live in poverty, but so do disabled people. In 2019, 25.9% of disabled people ages 18 to 64 were living in poverty in the so-called U.S., where only 11.4% 11 of able-bodied people were living in poverty. Um, personally, I think that that number of disabled people living in poverty could possibly be higher, um, just based on what I see. Uh, personally, but, you know, if you're a disabled native, the chances are pretty high that you're living in poverty and you're struggling to survive. And so that leads to other issues like housing instability and houselessness. Um, it's not just a matter of can you afford housing? It's a matter of can you find accessible housing? Can you find housing where you're not discriminated against because you're disabled? Um, and so because of that, our native disabled people have really high rates of houselessness. Um, Johnny J, who is Oto, Missouri in Choctaw, uh, recently sat on a call and gave me permission to share this, um, that 14% of the houseless population in Los Angeles is native, yet native people only make up 0.5% of the total LA population. Now of that 14% of our houseless relatives, 90% are disabled. Um, so how, you know, how do you care for yourself if you don't have housing? It's, it's a problem. And it's also harder for disabled people to even couch surf because can you get into your family members or your friends' homes? I can say for myself, I have many friends that I can't visit their homes because they're not accessible for me. So in many cases, you're going to end up on the streets because we also have to think about whether or not shelters are accessible and they're not always accessible. So other issues that lead to our higher rates of disability are food scarcity and insecurity and starvation. Um, we lack high quality, culturally competent health care. Um, you know, Indian health services and urban Indian health are chronically underfunded and they have almost no disability access either. Um, a relative gave me permission to share this with you all, um, but she is deaf and had said recently in a call that um, the IHS in her area won't get her an ASL translator and instead, they told her to use Facebook Messenger in order to communicate with the staff and health providers. Can you imagine being told that you're supposed to talk about intimate, personal, private things over Facebook Messenger, and that's the only way you can talk to a doctor? It's unsafe, it's ineffective, it breaks HIPAA laws, and it's just degrading and inexcusable. And this is but one example of what our disabled relatives are going through in terms of healthcare. care. Um, COVID-19, you know, just as many natives were left behind to die, so were disabled and chronically ill people. Um, and as a result of COVID-19, it's not just the people that we have lost. It's the people who have survived and now have long haul symptoms this is something we're talking a great deal about in the disability community is how many more disabled and chronically ill people we will now have in our community and what their needs are and how to meet those needs as a result of COVID-19. And as Native people who have been hit so hard, we really need to be thinking about what this means for us in terms of disability and health in the long term. You know, other things that lead to our higher rates of disabilities and illnesses are colonial violence, you know, are people being murdered, missing, 
assaulted, pollution, violence from law enforcement, that's all colonial violence. And that leads to things like trauma. So studies are finding that if you are somebody that has chronic, like long-term trauma, which so many of us natives have, um, that can lead to chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation can also lead to illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, or autoimmune arthritis, which I have. Um, so these are things we need to think about. And we need to think as well about how trauma is impacting us in terms of our mental health and our relatives that we are losing to suicide. And um, disabled people, particularly people with chronic pain and chronic illnesses, have really high rates of suicidality and attempts. So we really need to think about how our relatives who are chronically ill are doing in terms of their mental health and what supports that they need. Um, other issues are things like pollution and the climate crisis. Uh, many of us are having to live in polluted lands. We're living in places where there are fires, there are super storms, there are droughts. These things create and worsen health problems and disabilities. Um, the climate crisis itself also creates other issues for our disabled people, um, like evacuation. How do you evacuate if you're disabled, if you're low income, if you don't have the supports you need? You know, our relatives down in the United Homa Nation in southern Louisiana are dealing with this constantly. You know, the tribe only has two wheelchair accessible vans. And because they're not a federally recognized tribe, they don't get any FEMA funds or assistance. They have to rely entirely on their parish government or state government, which they don't like tribes. <laughs> they don't want to be helpful. Um, so what happens is they're not able to assist their tribal members, including disabled and vulnerable members, evacuate. Um, Hurricane Ida, which just came through, it came in at the end of the month on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, no less, where the majority of people who died were disabled people and people in nursing homes. Um, but Hurricane Ida, it hit at the end of the month. So people who are living on Social Security, and that includes SSDI and SSI, you're out of money at that point. You only get paid on the third of the month and you don't get paid much at all. That money is spent and gone before you ever get it. So how do you evacuate? And the answer is that you don't, you're left to die. Um, so the other thing I wanna talk about on the next slide is also how the government has deemed native people disabled for their own gains. And I'm gonna use a, a historical and, and a more present day example of this. And the first one is the Hiawatha Insane Asylum for Indians. Um, so I'm gonna give an image description because there's a picture of the asylum up. So in the foreground of it, there is a children's swing set on the the lawn on patch of grass. And then in the background, there is a large building. It's a three-story building with chimneys. It looks like it's brick and has a porch and it's a black and white photo. So in the late 1800s, as an attempt to create a local economy, two South Dakota congressmen created the federally funded Hiawatha Insane Asylum for Indians where native people from across the country, country were forcibly committed and institutionalized, often for reasons that had nothing to do with mental illness. Between 1903 to 1933, more than 350 native people were held there, and at least 121 people died in the facility. So people were held there for reasons that had nothing to do with mental health. Um, people were institutionalized there because they were disabled or disfigured. Um, there have been what's called ugly laws across the so-called U.S., basically saying if you are disfigured, you're disabled, you, you're ugly, and you're not allowed to be in public. So many disabled people have been institutionalized just for that, including at Hiawatha. Um, people were also institutionalized for refusing to give up traditional ways of life um, or for not complying with reservation agents because reservation agents could commit our relatives to Hiawatha. Um, some of the patients were also children. You know, we talk a lot, especially recently about the horrors of the boarding schools, 
But we also need to include how trauma from institutionalization has impacted our communities because it's real and lasting and it still happens to this day. So just as we find in the prison system today, patients often worked in asylums as a way to lower the cost for those running it and to create profit. So not only were we taking our native people away from their communities, from the land, their traditional ways as a way to make money for white men and the government, they were also being used as basically free labor. They were, they were servants, they were slaves in, in some ways. Um, so when the asylum was closed, it was due to its abhorrent conditions. And, you know, it really terrifies me personally to think about how awful it must have been for our people for officials in that day and time to find an asylum unfit for anyone, but especially for Native people. Um, it, it's, a, it's very upsetting for me thinking about what it must have been like for them. Um, and now sitting on top of the side where the asylum was is a golf course, <laughs> because why not? <laughs> Um, and so before we move on, I want people to know that institutionalization is not something from the past. It still happens to this day. And the mental health care field is rife with examples of medical abuse against Native people. Um, you know, even though asylums specifically for Natives no longer exist, we're still being misdiagnosed and institutionalized on a regular basis. You know, I'll I'll say for myself, some of my own mental health struggles have centered not so much around an illness, but more around trauma, abuse, a lack of housing and resources. You know, it, it, it came down to things that could easily be solved if we lived in a world that cared about people. Um, I myself was hospitalized as a child uh, for trying to commit suicide. Um, as an adult, when I've tried to speak openly and honestly with medical providers um, or social workers, caseworkers, you know, about how I'm doing with my mental health, but also trying to get them to understand that part of the mental health struggles are because I can't get good health care. I'm going to doctors and being disrespected. I tried to see a new psychiatrist today. I literally told her four times that I'm American Indian. And at the end, she still said to me, so you're not Caucasian. How do you go and get help if, if you can't even understand this most basic thing? Like you're never going to understand my gender, my disabilities, and you know the lack of resources in the world and how these are, are part of where I struggle with mental health. Um, and, you know, we're talking a lot, especially this month about suicide prevention. And so I want people to remember that while I do believe there are mental illnesses, um, a lot of what we consider an illness is really more a lack, it's more oppression and a lack of love coming from people and a lack of resources. Um, so when we talk about that, we, we need to remember that. Um, and when we talk about the medical industrial complex, which is what I call our healthcare system, because it's not really a system meant to care for us. It's meant to make us sick, keep us sick and make a profit off of us. Um, but we don't have enough time for me to go into that. <laughs> but when I talk about this system, um, I want people to remember that it's not as simple, like I've said, as going to a therapist or hospitalizing someone. Um, studies have found that people who've been institutionalized, they actually come out of the hospitals with higher rates of suicidality. So the next example of how the government has sort of created and, and disabled us um, for their own gains is South Dakota. And this is a, a present day issue that we have there. Um, so we know that our Native children are, are being stolen from our communities still to this day. Um, and one of the ways that this is happening is through the ableist family courts processes. <clears throat> so according to Ella Callo, is, who is an attorney and director of disability access and compliance at UC Berkeley, um, according to her, Native children of disabled people are often taken away by the state and ICWA, which is the Indian Child Welfare Act, often doesn't apply to them. Um, and the U.S. Department of Justice 
issued in 2015 guidelines that stated that the Americans with Disability Acts apply to all child welfare cases. And I want to explain what that means is that it's illegal to take a child from someone just because they're disabled. Well, the ADA and ICWA don't seem to apply and protect our Native families in court very often. So Ella said that in these cases, and I'm quoting her here, counsel on both sides are often, often kind of give up, affirming the underlying societal belief that parents with disabilities aren't capable of raising their own children. In South Dakota, a Native child is 11 times more likely to be placed in the foster care foster care system than a white child. And Native people comprise less than 9% of the population in South Dakota, but 52% of the children in the state's foster care system are Native. And while there are Native foster homes available, a majority of our children are placed with non-Native families or in group centers. And so ICWA and the ADA are always under attack. Um, you know, trying to get rid of ICWA is a way to undermine tribal sovereignty and trying to get rid of the ADA is a way of just continuing capitalism at all costs. So these two policies, while in my opinion, they are flawed and don't do nearly enough to protect our communities. If either of them went away, it could really be catastrophic for our, our children um, of disabled Native parents and for our communities, since we have such high rates of disabilities and illnesses, and this really could further our cultural genocide. Um, and just as what happened at the Hiawatha Asylum, you know, that capitalistic money-making scheme by white men and the government, the state of South Dakota has also used our children as a way to make money. Um, so the South Dakota courts were found for quite some time for declaring almost every single Native child they stole and placed in foster care as disabled. And by doing this, the state received more federal money for each Native child they stole from Native community. So the next thing I'm going to speak on is lateral violence and ableism in Native community. And here I'm going to really speak on my own personal experiences um, I speak only for myself. I don't speak for all disabled people or Native people, um, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all what I have seen over the years um, since I was a child and, and how that has impacted me and impacts our community. Um, so I quite often see just a complete lack of accessibility. Um, I have seen you know, been in situations, all kinds of situations where there is not sign language, um, there's no caption, there's no mobility friendly buildings. Um, you know, we're not included in the planning of events or in government, employment, housing, healthcare, community services, ceremony, or movement in frontline spaces. Um, I've been in frontline spaces where I've heard natives say that the quote infirmed should not be there or that there aren't any disabled people present. <laughs> um, you know, the National Congress of American Indians, their building is not disability accessible. Tribal government buildings are often not accessible. Um, our community events, our healthcare centers, you know, there is such a lack of accessibility and even awareness and thought of disabled people in Native community. And I'm always really surprised by this. Um, and I'm not, not quite sure why that is. But I have found that when I've brought up my concerns with people, I'm often met with hostility. Um, I've had people just say, well, it's not my responsibility. I'm not in charge. This isn't my thing. Um, you know, I've, I've also had people just seem utterly perplexed by the idea of disability inclusion because it, they've literally never thought about disabled people. And, you know, I see these things across our leaders and community members all the time. And an example that I'm going to give here, I'm going to call out my own tribe because they need to be called out. <laughs> so disabled voter disenfranchisement by the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Um, you know, only just recently in our last election where our at-large uh, council ballots and 
or excuse me, at large citizen voting ballots, of which there's well over 100,000 at large citizens. For us to vote, we had to go to a notary public to have our, our ballot notarized. Well, I've never voted in my elections because I either didn't have the money for a notary and or I couldn't leave my home. Um, and for me, it's not just do I have the money for a notary? It's do I have the money for a car to get me there? Or do I have the money for the parking? Because I just can't walk or take public transportation much anymore. You know, this, this disenfranchises a lot of voters in my tribe. And, you know, I recently, I, for a very long time, I didn't say anything. I think partially because a lot of us Native people are just more quiet. We're more reserved. We don't bring up our problems. But I just got so angry and fed up. That for this last election, because our ballots still said they have to be notarized, um, I contacted my at-large counselor and asked them, like, what is the tribe doing for our disabled people? I also asked what they're doing for two spirits, of which I got no answer. Um, but the response I got is, oh, we're taking care of our disabled people. There are no problems. And it's like, well, I can't even vote in our election. So I'd say that there are problems. And I also don't need to be taken care of. <laughs> it's just not about taking care of disabled people. It's about giving us room at the table. Um, it's about showing love for us and including us. Um, and if you can't even vote in your elections, it sends a very, very clear message that I am not welcome or at best, I'm just not enough of a priority to be included, you know, and this is, it's really hurtful. It's a really painful thing for me to try to talk about. Um, but it's another way that I feel very disconnected and alienated from Native community, um, you know, from my own indigeneity, uh, you know, and it makes me more vi vulnerable to violence and, and death, you know, we know that when banishment was a form of punishment, it, it was because we had to live together, you wouldn't survive. And that's kind of what ableism in native country, in native community feels like for me is it's like a form of banishment. Um, you know, and when I think about this, I think about how it also, it furthers native and disability erasure, it furthers genocide and it furthers eugenics. And to me, we're ultimately playing into the white man's colonial games. You know, when I think of decolonization, decolonization to me means ending all of the ills that colonialism brought here. And ableism is one of them. So decolonization means the end of ableism. And the end of ableism also means the full inclusion of all our Native people. So where do we go from here? So this is where I love this quote, Access is Love, by this amazing uh, disabled East Asian um, organizer, Mia Mingus. Mia is incredible. And in, in a speech they were giving, they said, access is love. And that's always really stayed with me. Um, because a lot of times when we talk about disability access, it comes out as it's a burden, it's an expense. It's an afterthought. It's never thought of what as what thought of as what it is, which is dignity and respect. It is your civil rights. It's your human rights. And it's a form of love. You know, if I can't even get into a building, then that tells me I'm not loved and that this is not my community. So access is love. It's not, it's a priority. It's not an afterthought. And so some things I want to quickly go over. I wish I had more time and I'm always available to talk more. But some of the things I want to say is that we need to be including disability access and meaningful inclusion and justice in our communities and then the ways that we think about decolonization. We also need to be offering accessibility and while accessibility in, is broad because disabilities are all different and access can mean a lot of different things for a lot of people, we need to get away from the model of, well, we'll provide you whatever service you need if you request it. 
disabled people are exhausted. <laughs> we're exhausted. I'm literally so tired. I just want to lay down in bed and cry right now. That's how tired I am. So I don't have the energy to ask people, hey, is this going to be accessible? What accessibility features will you have? You just need to offer them. They need to be offered right out the gate. There's basic things that should just be offered. And then also remember that, you know, if someone requests an access need, make it happen for them. Um, also, disability access is generally not something you can make happen overnight. You know, there's not a lot of ASL interpreters. What if someone says to you, oh, hey, I need to be able to get a motorized, you know, large chair into your building, but your building is only ADA accessible, which means it might not fit a power chair. So last minute access doesn't usually work for a lot of us. Um, but some things that you can do, uh, just some examples of different types of access, uh, which are on the next slide. Um, and the ways that these forms of access can include people, uh, some of which, you know, we've done tonight uh, are things like sign language interpreters. And remember, there are different sign languages. You know, sign language is a language just like English or Spanish. Not everyone uses the same kind of sign language. Um, captioning, which we have tonight. Uh, making sure that physical spaces go above and beyond just ADA access, which is ADA access is never enough. Um, other things are image descriptions, putting image descriptions in your social media posts, websites, newsletters, or events like tonight where Carrie and I described ourselves. Um, accessible websites and materials. And one of the things you can do that's really easy to help make things more accessible is using easy to read fonts like Helvetica, which I used here tonight in the slideshow. Um, priority seating. We need seating. <laughs> I don't go to most things anymore because there's no seating and I just can't stand. So there needs to be seating at events and we need to have seating that is specifically like set, like roped off or something that is for people who have to sit. This needs to be made and announcements need to be made during events for things like this. Um, help with food at meals. I cannot tell you the number of times I've been to native events where I either didn't eat or I ate be after everyone else. You know, there needs to be announcements, just like how we have announcements that our elders go first or in some communities, women and children. We need to be making announcements that people with disabilities or who need help can skip the food line. You know, I shouldn't have to wait until the end of the meal and get whatever scraps are left because it's difficult for me to stand and fill a plate and navigate a line while using a cane. You know, we also need to start normalizing that people can skip to the front if they need to, um, or offering to get people a plate of food. Other things we need to do are think about dietary needs like gluten or lactose free or lower carbs. These are all dietary needs I have. And there are a lot of the same dietary needs a lot of natives have. So having more food options also, like it doesn't just benefit those of us who are chronically ill, but it, it benefits everybody. Um, having access to quiet spaces because some people have sensory issues or maybe they get triggered and they just need a quiet space. Um, access to electrical outlets. That's something that a lot of people don't think about. Um, but, you know, I sometimes need to use a heating pad or somebody with a power chair may need to charge their chair or one of their devices. You know, access to electrical outlets is a lot more than just, oh, I need to charge my phone. Um, virtual events. We need to keep doing virtual events. Um, virtual events, virtual, you know, telehealth, telelearning, telework, those things make life more accessible for people like me. Um, but I also want to say in pushing for virtual events, we also have to push for, you know, high speed broadband. We have to push for telecommunications on our tribal lands and for all of our relatives, urban and rural, to be able to access the laptops and phones and services that they need because 
virtual events don't mean a lot if everyone can't have access to them, uh, which is something I quite often tell the disability community. Um, offer disability ass accessibility information about your event. Um, and when I say event, that can just be a potluck at someone's house. It can be a march. It can be, you know, a training at a health center. Um, let people know what accessibility is like. You know, it really enrages me when I show up to something and then find I have to either turn around and leave or climb up and down several flights of stairs or that the elevator is a freight elevator and I have to enter and exit the building where the trash is. Or, hey, there is an elevator, but no one bothered to turn it on. Or the bathrooms aren't accessible. You know, tell people, let us know what we're getting ourselves into so that we can decide if this is something we can come to or not. Um, check in on your more vulnerable relatives, you know, we're out here and we need help. Um, you know, I'll just say for myself, like during COVID-19, like this, this is not over for me. I'm immunocompromised. I'm on immunosuppressants. I will probably always wear a mask now, regardless of COVID, but because of COVID and because I'm so vulnerable, I still can't really go out in public much. You know, I'm still being really cautious. You know, I'm still going without things I need like healthcare or certain items. I haven't had a home health aid in months and I desperately need one. You know, this crisis, it's not over for me and it's not over for immunocompromised people. Um, and it's been really difficult to see able-bodied people, especially natives going back to powwows and conferences and everything without thinking about how people like me are still high risk. And by doing those things, you're putting me at even further risk. And it also means you're alienating people like me further from community. Um, so we're running out of time and I wanna have time for questions. Um, but I just, I wanna say, you know, we're human, we're flawed, we make mistakes, you're going to make mistakes, we are going to make mistakes. But it's how we handle those mistakes that matter. Um, and the thing that I really want folks to walk away with here, and honestly, I think you can think about this in all kinds of parts of life, not just disability uh, and ableism. But if someone is telling you that you've done them harm, it doesn't necessarily matter if it was intentional or not. You've still done harm. And I think the best thing to do is to stop and just take a breath, listen to what's being said to you, think about it, and then respond later. And in that response, and I'll say in terms of disability, that response needs to include your commitment to change, and then you better make that change. Um, listen and take direction from your disabled relatives. You know, self-determination for natives is also self-determination for disabled natives. We are the experts on our lives. You need to listen to us. And lastly, I want to say, learn about disability justice. There are so many great books and blogs and podcasts and great films and things coming out about disability justice. I want you to learn about those things. Just like I push the disability community to learn about Native community, I want to push my Native relatives to start learning about disability justice and disability community and start thinking about how that ties into decolonization. You know, we're your relatives and we need you just like you need us. Um, so with that, I'm just going to end with the last slide and we can open it up for questions. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. And if you have questions for me at a later date, you can email me at jdeerenwater at crushingcolonialism.org. You can also follow some of my work on the websites jdeerenwater.com and crushingcolonialism.org. Um, so do we have any questions? This is Carrie speaking, and it uh, looks like we have one person with a raised hand, so okay. figure that out. Um, JD, if you're able to assist uh, as a host with the uh, person who'd like to speak.
I don't know if there's a way to allow um, that. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you should see, like, I just clicked the raise hand and low hand. And I'm trying to allow Brandy to speak. Um, and I don't know. I how can to try, speak. Carrie. Give me one second. Thank you. This is Carrie again. Again, this is a learning process. So any uh, feedback you have, uh, we are uh, to receive. Okay, Brandy, awesome. Yasala, hi. you should be able to try. Okay, perfect. Okay, hi. My name is Shadalee Phoenix, and thanks, Jen. This is so informational. And I want to know, how can a person um, express what their needs are when they're constantly saying the same thing to medical providers, community, and relatives? Because it gets exhausting asking mm -hmm. for the same accommodations over and over. What would your be? What would your approach be? How to ask and not have to constantly do it, or do you have to constantly do it, even though the people know your needs? Yeah, um, I wish I had a good answer for you, but I run into this all the time. I mean, I'm I have to repeatedly say what I need, and it sadly doesn't mean that those needs will be met. Um, and that's, that's difficult. That's part of why we're doing this talk tonight. Um, I, I'm sorry that you're also facing that and struggling with that. It's, it's a lot and it is exhausting. Um, you know, I, what I have decided for myself personally, um, when it's a situation where I can just step away, I, I step away, um, I try to listen and I know this is not always possible, especially when you're disabled and you need to help and supports. But um, Tony Enos, who's a good friend of mine, he likes to say, if love is no longer being served at the table, then I get up and leave the table. And like I said earlier, access is love. And if people aren't willing to make that access, then I've had to walk away. And, and that's part of why I have said, I feel, you know, alienated, from community as a result of that. Um, I mean, the only thing that I could say beyond that is just having that clear list of this is what I need. Are you going to meet it or not? I, I wish I had something better for you. And that was helpful. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Wado. Wado. Are there any more questions? I am not seeing any more. Uh, this is Carrie speaking. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any more uh, in our Zoom chat. Uh, are there any comments or questions uh, on either Facebook page? Uh, this is Jessica from um, Lifelines Baltimore, and there are no comments on the Baltimore Facebook page. And Warren also stated that there are no comments on the Boston page either. This is Carrie speaking. Thank you. And Jen, uh, I, I appreciate appreciate this talk. I also am now just being more reflective of other meetings that I attend as an executive director of a health organization where the meetings are not accessible. So um, as a new commissioner on the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs, it is something that I definitely want to bring to the attention of the commission and see how we rectify that and also internally within our organization, ensuring that we have ASL, that we have, um, you know, just uh, other guides that we are continuing to check in on to make sure that events are accessible to everyone. So I really appreciate the great thought and care that you put into making sure that th there are some concrete steps that we can take. I, I don't 
think, or I hope that none of us are, are you know, we, we all want to be good relatives, right? And yeah. so we, we don't want to overlook our relatives or to, to make them to feel unvalued or undervalued. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, I am, I'm very, very thankful that I was able to have this time with you all tonight and, you know, want to say Wado again to all the people at Lifelines and everyone who has uh, joined us tonight. And with that, it looks like we're at almost seven o'clock. So um, Carrie or anyone at Lifelines, you have anything you want to add or are we saying good night? Um, I would just say, this is Carrie speaking. Uh, thank you again, Jen. We look forward to continuing the conversation with Jen and uh, hoping that Jen can help us come up with an organizational protocol to make sure that our accessibility and inclusivity is where we want it to be. I would recommend to anyone participating, whether you are Indigenous or not, um, Jen is a wonderful resource, um, just has such an amazingly powerful voice. And I hope that you might reach out to Jen uh, for assistance and also to anyone, uh, if, if we are, again, not where we should be, please let us know how we can change that. And we will work to make that happen. Uh, we want to be good relatives. We want to be loving and supportive. Um, and so, um, you know, your feedback is really helpful. Um, so I thank everyone for spending time with us. Um, I thank Jen for uh, just such an informative presentation and for all of the relatives who took the time to uh, learn or participate or offer comments or just their presence this evening. Um, it is, it is really appreciated. It's really appreciated and also shows your care and concern for our relatives who are living with disability. So with that, I wish everyone a, a good and safe evening and thank you for being with us, uh, Wopinani Natanka.